Hello, welcome to our live webcast, the latest in total joint replacement, including CJR, Medicare changes, and patient optimization for surgery. Thank you for joining us. My name is Caitlin, and I will be the operator for today's presentation. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of our web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the text chat window. There's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your questions. To send a question, hit in the text box and type your text. When you're finished, hit the send button. All the questions that you submit are only seen by our presenter today. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and they will be addressed at the end of our presentation. At the conclusion of today's program, we ask that you complete a brief post-event survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey in order to receive credit for attending and providing feedback of the webinar. We are joined today by our speaker, Dr. Tim Timothy Henderson. Sorry, and at, at this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our speaker, Dr. Henderson. The mic is yours. Hello, and good evening. Um, today, we're going to give a brief presentation on the latest in total joint replacement. Um, the CJR, Medicare Changes and Patient Optimization for Surgery. So we'll just get right into it. Um, <clears throat> the webinar agenda basically is the introduction which we had, the latest in total joint replacement, the CJR, which is the comprehensive care for joint replacement model, um, the definitions, intended goals, and proposed changes, the Center, for, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services rule changes, and patient optimization for total joint replacement surgery. And we'll follow that with discussions and questions. So the latest in total joint replacement, and for many of my colleagues, the many of my colleagues, um, <clears throat> robotics and total joint replacement is not very new, but for the public at large, it still is a new idea. The term robot is certainly not new. It originated in the, Slo the Slavic languages, robota, which meant uh, forced labor. Since then, robotics has progressed to describe an assortment of computer machines that perform pre-programmed, precise, and repetitive procedures. These computer machines have become integrated into the routine work workforce of multiple industries, including healthcare, and now have a growing role in total joint orthoplasty. Uh, we'll start with robot-assisted total knee replacement. In robot, uh, total, robotic total knee replacement, um, the program uses computer algorithms to convert anatomical data into virtual patient-specific 3D reconstruction of the knee joint. Although the first robotic total knee arthroplasty was performed in 1988 using the Acrobat robotic system, there's been a surge in robotic uh, total, joint arth total knee arthroplasty over the last decade. Depending on the degree of control that the robotic device provides the operating surgeon, the robotic systems are classified as either act fully active or semi-active assistants. The semi-active assistants are the ones we're most familiar with and the ones that are they're most widely used. Uh, so robot-assisted total knee replacement, the, the semi-active total knee arthroplasty actively controls and restrains the, sur the surgeon's motor functions to improve accuracy of, the, uh, of achieving the planned bone resection and, and, and implant position while reducing the possibility of inadvertent soft tissue injury. Several systems exist for this, including the MAKO system and, and Stryker, the Navio system. There are other systems such as the ROSA knee system with Zimmer. There are a few examples of that facilitate robot-assisted total knee arthroplasty. Um, robotic total knee arthroplasty is associated with improved precision, achieve, achieving the intended femoral and tibial implant positioning, joint line restoration, limb alignment, and tibial slope compared with conventional jig based total knee arthroplasty. In the Journal of Knee Surgery in 2017, Marchand evaluated 28, 28 robotic total knee arthroplasties matched with 20 conventional total knee arthroplasties and demonstrated that pain, patient satisfaction, and function scores via the WOMAC index were better in the robotic group compared with conventional group compared with the conventional group at six months after surgery. Improved preservation of periarticular soft tissue envelope secondary to reduced iatrogenic part periarticular soft tissue injury may help limit local inflammatory response, decrease pain, and reduce postoperative swelling compared to conventional total knee arthroplasty. However, improved accuracy of the implant positioning in robotic total knee arthroplasty has not translated into any differences in mid to long-term functional outcomes compared to conventional total knee arthroplasty. A randomized control trial with a 10-year follow-up was published in 2020 in clinical orthopedic-related research comparing outcome scores and long-term survivorship between robotic-assisted total knee arthroplasty and conventional total knee arthroplasty. The research found that at 10 years follow-up, 
there were no differences between robotic-assisted total knee arthroplasty and conventional total knee arthroplasty in functional outcome scores, aseptic loosening, overall survivorship, and complications. Over the last decade, it, uh, robotic total hip replacement has gained momentum as an avenue for reducing surgical error and improving the accuracy of implant positioning compared to conventional manual total hip arthroplasty. Despite our best intentions as surgeons, only 38 to 47 percent of acetabular components are within the, the desired safe ranges of anaversion and inclination using manual handheld techniques. Ilgen reviewed some 200 consecutive conventional total hip arthroplasties, followed by 100 consecutive to, uh, robotic total hip arthroplasties, and found that the robotic total hip was associated with a 71 percent improvement in accuracy of the acetabular implant positioning compared to manual total hip arthroplasty. There are four stages to complete robotic-assisted total hip arthroplasty in the surgical plan. First, a preoperative CT scan of the pelvis and proximal femur are obtained to create a patient-specific 3D model of the patient's hip anatomy. The surgeon then uses the 3D reconstruction to template the desired implant positions and sizes for achieving the desired bone coverage, restoration of hip biomechanics, component version, component inclination, and limb length correction. Next, while in the operating room, the surgeon intraoperatively maps the osseous anatomy of the acetabulum and the proximal femur to establish, bony, to establish bone geometry and confirm pelvic position prior to bone resection. Finally, the robotic arm is used to complete the planned bone resection and guide implant placement with live on-screen images and bone coverage, implant position, and limb length correction. So here we see how the robotic-assisted total hip arthroplasty is performed. Um, this is a Three, uh, a 3D um, rendition of the acetabulum where we're um, basically templating the, the bony structure and feeding that into the computer. Here is the acetabular reamer actually performing the restriction. This, there's actually an, an arm, that the computer arm, which is, which is uh, helping direct the surgeon while doing the acetabular reaming. Here's what we see while we're reaming, while we're, we're resecting the, 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 femoral, the, the acetabular bone. And basically, the acetabulum changes colors from from uh, into green when you're in the appropriate zone. If you get to red, you're going too deep, which is which is often hard to do because the the arm is controlling you. Uh, the next the next portion down is the implant positioning of the actual acetabular cup, and here you see the surgeon ba basically getting ready to mount with the assistance of the computer arm to mount the acetabular component into, into position. Robot assisted total hip replacement has. Despite the accuracy improvement in implant positioning and restoration of hip biomechanics, the robotic assisted total hip replacement has not translated to differences in short-term functional outcomes compared to conventional manual total hip arthroplasty. Siebel conducted a prospective randomized study on 36 robotic total hips versus 35 con con conventional total hips and found no difference in the Harris hip score between the two groups at an average of 18 months after surgery. Chen conducted a systematic uh, review and meta-analysis of 994 conventional total hips versus 522 conventional uh, robotic total hips and found no difference in functional outcomes, stress shielding, limb length discrepancy, rates of revision, uh, or rates of re revisions between the two surgical treatment types. Robot, robotic technology has several limitations that must be understood when discussing the current role and the future potential of this technology. Number one, robotic assisted total joint replacement is associated with the significant cost of the device, serving the soft, servicing the software and training the staff to become familiar with the new hardware and workflow. The technology is only compatible with a select number of implants from specific manufacturers. There's also a steep learning curve for the surgeon and delays are to be expected until proficiency, until proficiency is achieved. As with all to, new technology in medicine and surgery, there's a paucity of prospective randomized control trials reporting the long-term outcomes. Thoughts for the future of robotic assisted total joint arthroplasty? Robots have now become integrated into the routine work forces of many industries, including aviation, military, finance, construction, and engineering. Healthcare and surgery are no different. This technology has improved each of these industries to achieve a sustained level of precision, productivity, and efficiency that were not attainable with humans alone. It demands repeating that within each of the sectors that I've mentioned that, that have integrated robotic technology into their workforce, the use of this technology has never diminished or exited the industry. Basically, what I'm saying is robots, depending on, uh, regardless of how we feel about them in surgery, they're likely here to stay. 
Another um, latest trend in total joint replacement, which is not particularly cutting edge or new, but is still new to the public, public, public at large, is outpatient total joint replacement. A few years ago, this was seen as controversial, and now it is quickly becoming an accepted standard of care. In 2019, Medicare removed total knee replacement from the inpatient only list, and in January 2020, total hip replacement was also removed from the list. To uh, safely perform outpatient total joint replacement surgery, there are several factors that need to be addressed. One is the fear and anxiety that comes with, with a new experience of complex surgery in the outpatient setting and the concern about management of surgical pain. A safe outpatient total joint replacement program must also mitigate against the risks associated with the patient's comorbidities and reduce, and reduce the risk of medical complications. Surgeons and perioperative staff associated with outpatient total hip replacement must manage the side effects of treatment, including anesthesia, minimizing blood loss, and reducing surgical trauma. Patient selection remains among the most important parts of performing outpatient total joint replacement. Uh, in 2017, Dr. Meningini performed a retrospective review and developed the Outpatient Arthroplasty Risk Assessment Score. The ORA score was developed by a high-volume arthroplasty surgeon and a perioperative internal medicine specialist to identify patients as low, moderate, and not appropriate for early discharge stratification. The ORA, the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiology Physical Status Classification System, and the Charles Charleston comorbidity index scores were analyzed with respect to length of stay and compared to each other. The OR score had a positive predictive value of 81.6% for the same day or next day discharge, compared to that of 56.4% of the ASA and 70.3% of, of the CCI scores. These results suggest that the OR score or similar perioperative assessment tools can successfully facilitate appropriate patient selection for outpatient total joint replacement. A retrospective review co conducted by Dr. Barron in the Bone and Joint Journal in 2018 examined the outcomes of 1,472 outpatient total hip replacements performed in a surgical center from 2013 to 2016. Only 87% of the patients needed to stay overnight for 23, hour, 23 hours of observation, 39 for convenience, 48 for medical observation, which was mostly associated with, most frequently associated with urinary retention, obstructive sleep apnea, emesis, hypoxia, and pain management. The overall complication rate requiring unplanned care was only 2.2%. Dr. Barron believes there are certain medical comorbidities that make patients inappropriate for outpatient total joint replacement in the surgery center. Congestive heart failure or valvular disease, severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or the, with the use of oxygen, obstructive sleep apnea with a BMI of over 40, severe renal disease, anemia, anemia with hemoglobin under 13, a, a history of CVA, history of delirium or dementia, and solid organ transplant patients. The presence of one or more major comorbidity was associated with increased risk of overnight medical observation, and the specific comorbidities associated with increased risk were coronary artery disease, COPD, frequent urination, and benign prosthetic hypertrophy. The take-home message from Dr. Barron's review was, with appropriate optimization of medical comorbidities, total hip arthroplasty may be, may be safely undertaken at an ambulatory surgery center. However, the likelihood of need for an overnight stay is related to the presence of preoperative, preoperative comorbidity, but these comorbidities are not related to the risk of postoperative complications. The combination of patient education, medical optimization, and a multimodal program to reduce the use of narcotics results in the ability to perform outpatient total hip replacements in, large, in a large portion of patients without the need for a standardized risk assessment score. Um, at Chilton Medical Center, we have an outpatient total replacement program, which I which I helped run. It was a uh, it was adopted from Dr. Charles de Cook program conducted at Northside Hospital in Atlanta. It consists of a robust multimodal anesthesia program, reduced tissue trauma surgery, aggressive mobilization, and almost no narcotics. My preoperative uh, um, um, anesthesia cocktail, a multimodal anesthesia cocktail, consi consists of Lyrica 150 milligrams by mouth. Acetaminophen, 1,000 milligrams IV, dexamethasone, a 0 0.15 mg per kg IV, ketamine, a 0 0.25 mg per kg IV, and toradol, 30 milligrams IV. This is given prior to the surgery, in addition to transexamic, transexamic acid. Preoperatively, our total knees undergo an adductor canal and popliteal nerve block. This allows for maintenance of quad function postoperatively while providing pain relief. 
We recommend spinal anesthesia to limit the amount of to limit the amount of uh, IV sedatives, but our patients often request general anesthesia. We ask our anesthesia colleagues to provide opiate-free anesthesia as much as possible. We perform our total knee replacements with a standard medial power patella approach without the use of a tourniquet. Our, oper our operative time runs from 50 to 75 minutes. We estimated our blood loss to be between 100 and 200 cc's. A Provena negative pressure dressing is utilized in each case. For our total hip replacements, once again, we recommend spinal anesthesia, but our patients still often request general anesthesia. We ask, continue to ask our anesthesiologists to limit the opioids during surgery. We perform our total hip replacements through a direct an anterior approach with the use of an anterior hip table attachment. We perform uh, a periarticular injection with a mixture of Marcan and Expiro. Our operative time runs between 45 to 75 minutes. And we estimate our blood loss to be at a, about 100 to 150 cc's. A, neg a Provena negative pressure dressing is utilized in each case as well. Uh, our post-operative post um, uh, analgesia program consists of oxy oxycodone or tramadol, tramadol for breakthrough pain. When same-day discharge is planned, the PACU nursing staff is reminded after the surgery to limit the use of narcotics, and that is very important. We use gabapentin 300 milligrams three times a day, ibuprofen 800 milligrams three times a day with food, in addition to Pepsi if the patient has a history of dyspepsia. We also use acetaminophen 1,000 milligrams uh, every eight hours and recommend icing the surgical site 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off while awake. Physical therapy begins once the patient has recovered from general anesthesia the, or spinal anesthesia in the hospital. It's, it's generally weight bearing is tolerated with assisted walking devices. They receive an additional dose of IV antibiotics prior to, prior to discharge as well as an additional dose of transexamic acid. If deemed appropriate by me or the, or the PA, they are discharged home. Home physical therapy, DME, and the limit, limited prescription for not a, narcotic pain medications, Motrin, Tylenol, and Gabapentin have been previously arranged. And the patient follows up with us in 10 to 40 days for post-operative evaluation. Here are some um, examples of uh, total joint replacement uh, surgeries that we've performed. There's a video that will come with this. This is Ms. Lisa Charles. She is a 54-year-old female who underwent a left uh, direct anterior othello, that's anterior total hip equal leg length operation, outpatient total hip replacement on Saturday. And she, she is back. 70, almost 72 hours out from surgery and looking good. How is your experience with the outpatient total hip replacement? Uh, it's been amazing. Like, it's everything that I really had envisioned. And okay. Very Dr. Anderson knows I'm kind of a sports enthusiast, so I needed something to do with that. <laughs> Absolutely. How much pain are you having at this point? So at this point, it really is it's at a threshold of 2 to 3 on, okay. on a scale of 10. Okay. And can we watch you walk? Can you take some steps towards us? Lisa Charles, 54 years old. Left total hip replacement approximately uh, 72 hours ago. Turn around and head on back. She has a slight antalgic gait, nothing too severe. Walking without assistive devices, of course, and turn around. All right, great. We will see you. Yeah, <laughs> we will see you back. We will see you back with us in about uh, a week to get uh, your staples out. Take care. And there's one additional video to show that I just don't operate on young, thin, athletic people. This is Mr. Curtis Barcy. He's a 69-year-old gentleman who had his uh, uh, right anterior, to I'm sorry, right, left, left anterior total hip replacement done approximately three days ago. On Friday, it's Tuesday today. He was an outpatient. He, how long were you in the hospital, Mr. Barcy? Uh, 10 in the morning to... Uh, Okay. Any trouble going home? Did you have any difficulty or anything like that? No. Okay. Can you take some steps towards me? Yes. Mr. Curtis Farsi, 69-year-old male, left and direct anterior hip replacement approximately 72 hours ago. You can turn around and uh, head on back that way. Really nice. Pretty good. Very slight antalgic gait. And you can turn around right there. So any uh, comments, complaints, or anything like that regarding your... Uh, Hip replacement? No, the hip feels uh, fine. It's just uh, pain in the uh, site. Okay, very good. Thank you. We'll take another video in a couple weeks. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. 
the next latest trend in total joint replacement, I'd be um, negligent if I didn't mention something about COVID-19 um, when I was creating this talk, um, as you see when I basically finish it, on uh, November 16th, at two, uh, 2020 at 7.45 p.m., we had over 11 million cases of COVID-19 and uh, almost 250,000 attributed deaths. The wave of COVID-19 infections sweeping across the United States uh, was followed Monday uh, by a spate of new lockdowns and calls to reimpose restrictions after a week when, all, when more than a million new cases were, were reported. As we approach the winter season of 2020, this deadly virus continues unabated and is most likely in a second, second surge. Additional efforts may be required to ensure access to elective orthopedic care in the, in the near future. Here's a map of basically the COVID uh, average daily uh, cases per 100,000 people in the past week, and we can see the red areas, and it's basically sp spreading uh, as a disease would. I believe orthopedic surgeons may need to begin considering the possibility of a second round of restrictions. The AOS has um, provided us with clinical, clinical um, principles and, and considerations during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, number one, is safety of patients is paramount when deciding to schedule an elective procedure. The next highest priority is the safety of the healthcare per personnel and staff. Um, he, the AOS recommends we follow health, guide health guidelines of the CDC, federal, state, and local authorities. Um, decision for providing care should be based locally, based on the rate of transmission, the number of ICU beds, ventilators, and, and the availability of PPE. And they recommend following legal restrictions such as shutdown and stay-at-home orders. In addition, the AOS has released a position statement regarding the increasing urgency of elective care as patients in need of orthopedic treatment experience more pain and disability during COVID-19. They state that many patients will lack access to care because of COVID-19 financial consequences. Telemedicine, although important, cannot fully address these needs. Many patients experience harm as a result of delays in care. Increased access to specialist office care and time-sensitive surgery will be needed to address the COVID-19 backlog. The responsibility of financing appropriate health care services must be a shared public-private effort that advances patients, the patient-centered model for choosing affordable health care options. So they basically created this algorithm for how we're to choose in the event of restrictions, how to choose to perform surgery or not to perform surgery. You see the patient in your in your in your office. You say they they need surgery, total hip or total knee replacement. You consider their risk factors. If they're over 75, their BMI is over 40. If they have diabetes and colitis or COPD or heart disease or hypertension or they're immunocompromised, such as an active cancer patient or someone on uh, chemotherapy. If they don't have these things, you can proceed with your regular preoperative workup, including COVID-19 screening. If they do have these comorbidities, um, you have to wonder, you have to ask if these comorbidities are substantial. If they are, you delay surgery. If they're not substantial, um, you have to weigh whether the complaints of the patient outweigh the risk. And if they, if they do, then you can proceed with your surgical planning. If they do not, defer surgery. Um, and unfortunately, many orthopedic surgeons are in a situation when the restrictions do hit your practice and we're, we're shut down or partially shut down. The AOS has also provided um, it provided guidance of, of, of COVID-19 uh, financial release. Um, right now, there continue to be ways to apply for financial release, and the AOS, the AAOS Member Resource Center, provides concise information on low programs should you need it. So CJR. What is, what, is the C, what is CJR? CJR is a comprehensive care of joint replacement. It's a bundled payment program from the Center of Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid Services. The CJR was implemented with the goal of reducing costs and improving care for patients undergoing the most common inpatient surgeries billed to Medicare, total hip and knee replacements. The, the program originally established to run for five performance years began on April 1, 2016 and was slated to end on December 31, 2020. How does CJR work? A CJR episode begins when a patient is admitted under either MSDRG 469, which is a major, major joint replacement um, or reattachment of lower extremity with major complications or comorbidities, or DRG uh, 470 without major complications, and it ends 90 days post-discharge. Annually, CGR participating hospitals receive episode target prices for the DRGs 469 and 470. Services are paid for, for as usual when billing Medicare throughout the year, but at the end of the year, the end of the P CJR performance year, the spending for these episodes is compared to the Medicare target price. 
Depending on the hospital's quality score and total episode spending, a participant may receive an additional payment or be required to repay a Medicare portion of its episode spending. The model tests whether bundled payment and quality measures associated with hip and knee replacements can incentivize hospitals, physicians, post-acute care providers, and post-acute care providers to work together to improve quality of care from the initial hospitalization through recovery. So does the CJR target pricing actually work? The top five, five uh, highest average costs for major joint replacements with complications under Medicare participating at CJR were compared with the highest, um, with, with the hospitals not participating in CJR. When billing Medicare, we see the, the highest average payment of the MSR DRG 469 in 2019 was $40,661. For the top five highest average costs of major joint replacement without complications under all payers, meaning it doesn't necessarily is not necessarily under the CGR, when we open the scope to all payers, the average payment per claim for major joint replacement jumps by, by approximately 300% to $152,433. It can be debated how much that price difference is attributed to the CJR, yet it appears that CM, the CMS is doing something right regarding overall cost of care when it comes to joint replacements. How are participating CJR hospitals chosen? In the first two years, the CJR model mandated participation for all IPPS providers within certain CMS selected regions. When the final, final rule was published in December 1, 2017, partition became voluntary for rural and low volume providers in half the form, formerly mandated region as well. As of February 1, 2018, approximately 465 uh, IPPS hospitals in, in 67 different MSAs were participating in the CJR model. What are the recent proposed changes to the CJR? The, uh, there's a, the rule that's, that's being proposed to go into effect next year. This rule proposes to change certain aspects of the CJR model, including the episode of care definition, target price calculation, the reconciliation process, beneficiary notification requirements and the appeals process, gain sharing caps, Medicare, pro Medicare program rule waivers. In addition, the rule proposes to extend the CGR model for an additional three, year, three years through December 31st, 2023 to allow time to test the proposed changes. So what are the changes? There are changes to the definition of the CGR episode to include outpatient, knee, and hip replacements. The episode definition has changed in order to address the changes to the inpatient only list that now allow for, for total knee replacements and total hip replacements to be treated in the outpatient setting. What are the recent proposed changes? I'm sorry, the, the rule also proposes changes to the CJR target price calculation. Specifically, CMS has proposed to change the basis for the target price from three years of claims data to the most recent one year claims data. In addition, they propose to remove the national update factor and twice yearly update to target prices that accounts for prospective payment system and fee schedule updates to remove anchor factors and weights. What, uh, introduction, they also propose to introduce the risk adjustment factors in reconciliation calculation. Thus far, target payments, target payment rates in the CGR program only differentiate patients who had a major complication or emergency fractures from elective surgery. The CMS is proposing that the hierarchical condition category and beneficiary age as a risk adjustment factor count beginning with the performance year six meaning patients with chronic illnesses, greater functional or cognitive, cognitive limitations will generally require rehabilitation for longer periods of time in more expensive settings than healthier patients with fewer limitations. This can lead to the greater variation in post, the post-acute co cost of care. Hospitals serving disadvantaged populations may be, be dispropor disproportionately impacted by the penalties. An analysis of CGR year two data showed hospitals with a high percentage of dual eligible, dual, dual eligible beneficiaries, those with both Medicare and Medicaid insurance, were more likely than low dual hospitals to be penalized, 24% versus 13%. Safety net hospitals are often committed to serving the most vulnerable patients. And even if they want to, they may not have access to the patient population, which allows them to cherry pick healthier patients for surgery. Financial penalties, penalties as a result of caring for more complex patients further reinforces a system that provides fewer resources to safety net hospitals and capitulates healthcare outcome disparities. Effective January 1st, 2021, the, CP, the CPT Evaluation and Management e &M Office, basically for office and other outpatient services codes and guidelines will undergo significant changes. The changes are coming for codes 99201 and 99215, 
removing the counting of key components in the history and instead allows the providers to choose E&M levels based on either medical decision making or time. The code 99201 will be removed. Tips to prepare. Loaner routinely document items that will be used to score medical decision making, including ordering tests and x-rays, interpreting outside documents, speaking with other healthcare professionals, and using other histories, historians aside from the patient. Become familiar with the necessary data and the risk of complications documentation needed to achieve particular le levels of medical decision making. The EHR templates will need to be revi revised to focus on el elements of medical decision making, medical decision making, and de-emphasize history in, in the exam. Effective January 1st, um, the 2021 work RVUs uh, for EMM codes uh, will reflect subtle subtle increases, um, which is which is a plus. Currently, the CMS is proposing to accept the American Medical uh, Association Relative Value Unit Scale Update uh, proposal to decrease the, the WRBU for total hip and total knee arthroplasty, codes 27130 and 27447, from 20.72 to 19.60, which represents a 5.4% cut for these services. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Academy of Hip and Knee Surgeons has objected strongly to these changes. The AOS President John Bosco issued a statement indicating that AOS is extremely disappointed in the CMS, in the CMS regarding these, these proposals. <clears throat> the, CM, the CMS has also released for, for year 2021 um, the outpatient perspective payment system proposed rule. What, mean, what this means is the agency is proposing to significantly alter the circumstances regarding outpatient care setting by eliminate the, eliminating the entire inpatient only list over the next three years. The AOS president is concerned that payers, including Medicare Advantage and commercial co carriers, may misinterpret, may misinterpret the policy changes to indicate that these services must be performed exclusively in the outpatient setting. This can potentially add delay to, to existing prior authorization requirements and can jeopardize timely access to care. Patient optimization for surgery. What is patient optimization? It is the, pr the process of performing preoperative intervention focusing on decreasing pre-surgical risk factors to help obtain high-quality outcomes after surgery. Components of the program may include medical evaluation and supervision, diagnostic testing, and nutritional assessment and counseling. Why are we focused on patient optimization? Well, it improves improved patient outcomes and increases the chance of postoperative infection. This increases surgeon reimbursement, decreases the cost of providing services, and better outcomes lead to, lead to greater patient satisfaction, which leads to happier surgeons. Surgeon, why are we focused on patient optimization? Well, surgeons are now incentivized for improved performance. Patient outcome measures drive reimbursement. Operating on high-risk patients increases the risk for complications. In the setting of the CGR, bundled payments, and bonus rates tied to patient satisfaction, satisfaction scores, Outcome measures and improved performance have tangible financial consequences. We're also very interested in patient optimization secondary to periprosthetic infections, the incident of 1% to 2.55%. In 2010, peri periprosthetic joint infection cost $566 million for the year, and in 2020, it's projected to cost $1.6 billion. Seven, there is a 7% mortality between the first and second stage of revision orthoplasty for treatment of periprosthetic joint infections. So postoperative periprosthetic joint infections are not benign complications. That mortality rate is higher than some cancers. We're focused on patient optimization because decrease, decreasing the, it's important to decrease the cost of providing joint replacement services. 21% of the U.S. population age 18 and older have arthritis. It's estimated that 67 million people, or 25% of the adult population, will have arthritis in 2030. Thus, it is critically important to decrease the cost of performing total joint arthroplasty as it could consume an oversized portion of available healthcare dollars. How do we optimize the patient, uh, the total joint replacement patient? A multi multidisciplinary team approach is essential. Uh, the total, arthro total joint arthroplasty surgeon and their associated staff, the anesthesiologist, the nurses and their perioperative staff, therapists, and administrat administrative coordinators. 
at AHS, we use the, the, the readmission risk assessment tool, the RAT. It was developed at NYU and published in the JB, JBJS in 2015. It includes risk factors such as staph aureus colonization, smoking, obesity, cardiovascular disease, venous thromboembolic disease, neurocognitive problems, physical decondition and, de deconditioning, and diabetes. The R, uh, modified RAT tool is collected on each CGR elective total joint patient at AHS hospitals. An RAT score of greater than three is significantly associated with readmission. If the patient has an RAT score of four, five, and six, this information will be provided to the surgeon prior to surgery. The surgeon will be given the data as to which areas are higher risk in addition to, to, to an estimate of the risk of readmission. The RAT also provides suggested interventions to help positively, help positively modify the present, the, the present risk factor. So modifiable risk factors. A BMI of over 40, we, we have diet recommendations, referral to weight loss specialist, and last resort, we refer to the bariatric surgeon. Cardiovascular disease, the patient must be, if they, they, if they have it present, they must be cleared and optimized by the cardiologist. Diabetes mellitus, uh, we refer them to an endocrinologist and try to get their A1C down to appropriate levels. If they're smokers, and um, we recommend smoking cessation, if the patient is an uh, unreliable historian on that, we can get cotinine testing, which is quite accurate. If, they have a, if we have an MRSA history uh, obtained uh, on nasal, nasal, swab, nasal swab or history of previous infection, we recommend nasal bactropan um, twice a day for five days pre-op, as well as a chlorhexidine wash for five days pre-op. Their history of DVT or PE, we're aggressive, aggressive DVT and PE, PE a prophylactic ma management. If they have neurocognitive neuro problems, we refer them to the behavioral health uh, program. And if they're physically deconditioned, we recommend a prehab, a prehab program. So why is BMI an important modifiable risk factor? In two, 2019, JBJS systematic, systematic review and meta-analysis revealed that severely obese people morbidly obese patients and super obese groups were at an increased risk for peri periprosthetic joint infection compared to the non-obese group with a risk ratio of 3.17 for the severely obese, 9.75 for the morbid obese, and 7.22 for the super obese patient. We've all been there. Why is diabetes an important, mod important modifiable risk factor? A retrospective study performed um, examined uh, perioperative hyperglycemia and postoperative infection after lower limb arthroplasty in the Journal of Diabetes and Science and Technology. The study showed that perioperative morning hyperglyce hyperglycemia of over 200 increased by more than two times the risk of infection that requires surgical intervention after elective total hip and knee arthroplasty. Even patients without diagnosed diabetes had a threefold increase in the risk of infection if the fasting bl blood glucose on postoperative day one was greater than 140. Why is smoking an important modifiable risk factor? A systematic review and meta-analysis in the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2019 was performed to quantitatively assess the association between, between tobacco use and the risk of wound complications and periprosthetic joint infection after primary total hip and total knee arthroplasty procedures. Fourteen studies were included in the analysis. Users of tobacco had a significantly higher risk of wound complications with a risk ratio of 1.78, and periprosthetic joint infection with a risk ratio of 2.02 2 .02 compared to non-tobacco users. Does, so does, does preoperative patient optimization work? Greater Memorial Hospital in Atlanta is a 900-bed teaching hospital. It's actually where I trained when I was at Emory. Uh, at, at Grady, we had a historically high infection rate for total joints, and the total joint service was closed and restarted using a new patient optimization protocol we dropped our rates from 12.9% to 1.9% based upon using the protocol, which is dramatic. A 2018 study in the Journal of Arthroplasty evaluated whether the implementation of a perioperative screening criteria lowers infection and complication rates following elective total hip replacement arthroplasty and total knee arthroplasty in the veteran population. The overall complication rates reduced from 35.14% to 14.8% with total knee arthroplasty complications, reducing the rate from uh, reducing the rate from 33.1% to 15%, uh, while while uh, total hip arthroplasty complications reduced from 42.4 to 14.2%. Further, 
Furthermore, combined total knee and total hip arthroplasty infection rates decreased from 4.4% to 1.3%. So why are we focused on patient optimization? Lastly, the population health management, cost-effective care, and optimization of outcomes to maximize value are the new maxims for healthcare delivery in the United States. Reducing readmissions after total joint arthroplasty is, is, is as challenging as it is important. Preoperative risk stratification and optimization and pre-surgical care have become essential in reducing complication and readmission after total joint arthroplasty. The future of optimization. There's new lab work uh, being evaluated, including evaluation of uh, preoperative vitamin D levels. There's a link between pro-hormone vitamin D25 and, norm and the normal innate immune response. There's, potential to there's a potential here to have a role in prevention of periposthetic joint infections. Also, improvement in, communicate in communication with a total joint arthroplasty patient may be part of patient optimization. This theoretically improves patient satisfaction press gainy scores, and hospital consumer assessment of healthcare provider system scores, HCAPs. This also potentially decreases the need for actual phone calls by office staff during preoperative and, post and the postoperative period. That completes my talk um, on the latest in total joint replacements, uh, Medicare changes, CGR, and CGR changes in patient optimization. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd love to hear them. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. We appreciate that. Um, as a reminder to our attendees, the text chat window uh, is located on the right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question, please type in the small text box at the bottom, then when finished, hit the send button. Please also note that due to our time constraints, um, our speaker may not be able to respond to all questions submitted, but please do ask. Dr. Henderson, we have one. Okay, where can I see it? Oop. It's not completely showing on this. I think I have to move it over. Um, okay, I have to just double right click it. Got you, yep. James Anderson. Uh, after total joint replacement, are there any indications for intraarticular injections? Um, let me see. Sorry, uh, any inter indication for intraarticular injections with corticosteroid, hyaluronic acid, PRB, or BMAC? And if so, how long? Uh, how how long after? Do you find this there is any benefit? So. I will tell you, I personally do not um, inject corticosteroid, and I try not to re-inject total, total um, knee replacements or total um, hip replacements. Now, I know several of my colleagues do, and several of my well-known colleagues do, and they, they do get significant result, uh, benefit from it. I just think it's a little bit, I don't know if the risk is, is, is good as, is, is important as, as the reward um, for introducing iatrogenic um, infection, which can happen following a, a steroid injection, which I, which I have seen before. I often inject my patients for uh, pesanthromine bursitis or um, uh, um, iliotibial band syndrome following um, knee replacement surgery or greater trochanteric bursitis or iliopsoas bursal injections after a total hip replacement, but not directly into the joint. But the answer is yes, there are indications. I just don't personally do it. Thank you. And um, we still do have some more time for questions. so. Please feel free to submit. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Some surgeons are not sending patients to post-op physical therapy after total hip replacement. What is their rationale? So, there are actually several studies that indicate that patients are no better um, whether they attend physical therapy or whether they don't. And, and you know, we we grew up and we were trained on getting everyone into physical therapy immediately after surgery for total hip and total knee replacement. You know, we used to use CPM machines as well, which we found out didn't do that much overall. Um, we're learning, um, we're learning slowly that, that, that rehab and physical therapy after total hip and uh, total hip, total knee replacements, um, particularly total hip replacements may not be as important as we, as we think they are. In addition to the fact that it costs money to send patients to physical therapy postoperatively. So in the, in a, in, 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 you know, following a bundle conversation and the conversation about bundle payments and CGR, decreasing the amount of physical therapy a person needs after after surgery will obviously increase the the, the savings um, and, and not spend as much money as you would have otherwise. And if the results are the same, I, I kind of agree. I haven't adopted this approach this approach yet because I'm slow to adopt things, but but I am taking a close look at that. And there's a possibility I move to less physical therapy in the new near future. 
good question. If we don't have any more questions, then we can wrap the talk up. All right. Sounds good. Thank you again. And on behalf of Atlantic Health System, um, Chillin Medical Center, Orthopedic Surgery, I would like to, take, to thank you again for your participation in our event today. A post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please do take a moment to complete this survey in order to receive credit for attending our webinar. And this concludes our program. Thank you again. Have a very good night. Thank you.